the purpose or point of the trapezoid rule and Simpson's rule is to give us a way to approximate or estimate the value of a definite integral. Typically one that cannot be integrated. That's really why we're even talking about this, because right? again, we've seen We've seen that there are functions that we can't anti-differentiate. A couple of examples would be something like the integral from zero to three of e to the x squared, or the integral from one to eight of, of one's a bad choice there, two to eight of one over natural log of x, or the integral from zero to pi of sine of x squared. All these are literally impossible to anti-differentiate. It's kind of neat to think that there are actually functions like you can't find their antiderivative. Um, so to do this, we're going to use the trapezoid. I know we talked about the trapezoid symbol rule last time a little bit. So let me just throw the formula at you. So if we're trying to estimate or approximate the following integral, just the usual like the integral from A to B of f of x dx using n sub intervals, sub intervals. The trapezoid formula looks like this. I typically write, whoops. Um, actually, the one thing I do want to do is draw a little picture. So if we're breaking this up into n sub intervals, we usually think of a as x sub zero, and then you have like x sub one, x sub two, all the way to b is x sub n, and the one before it is x sub n minus one. Then the trapezoid rule using n sub intervals is your delta x over two times, and then it's the one, two, 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 one pattern, where it's one times f of x naught plus two times f of x one plus two times f of x two, all the way to the second to last one is two times f of x sub n minus one, and then one times f of x sub n. So that's the trapezoid rule, and it's really just that pattern, one, two, 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 one. And then, I should actually move here. I don't know the cool. And then Simpson's rule is very similar, except Simpson's rule using n sub intervals is delta x over three, and it's the one, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, one pattern. So it's one times f of x naught plus four times f of x one plus two times f of x two, and then it keeps going, alternating, alternating, alternating. And then finally, the last three terms are a two times f of x sub n minus two, a four times f of x sub n minus one, and the one times f of x sub n. And it was a little messy over there, sorry. So the thing to remember for the Simpsons rule is n must be even. Oh, sorry, yep. I should zoom, let me just zoom out a little bit. I tried to zoom in so it was a little easier to see, but that's the wrong call. Okay, Every, everything is visible. It's always hard to get these cameras synced up perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, which makes some sense if you think about it, right? Because if n, like for example, if n were seven, just to, or let's say if n were five, you would have a one times f of x naught, a four times f of x one, a two times f of x two, a four times f of x three, a two times f of x four, and then oh, at x5, you need to get back to one, but you also need to get to four before you get to one. So we don't get the pattern to work if it's an odd number. So n equals five. Thank you. Simpson's rule doesn't work. And then we also have some error formulas. So yeah, let's keep things in order.
the error formulas. Oh, there was one other thing I meant to say on that previous page, sorry. I know you probably already know this, but let me just be very succinct here. Um, our delta x is, of course, b minus a divided by a, which I knew you got. We're talking about Simpson's rule, trapezoid rule again, and, the, and we're about to talk about the error formulas. So the error formulas, most people, when they test you on them, they typically give them to you, but it's still, even if they're given to you, you still have to know how to use them. So for the trapezoid method, the error using the trapezoid method is less than or equal to b minus a cubed over 12 n squared times, and here's the part that's always like the actual part where we have to do some work. It's the absolute value of the maximum of, oh wait, let me actually, let me double check if I'm saying that right. Mm, I'm saying that kind of slightly wrong. Sorry, it's not the absolute. It's the maximum of the absolute value of the second derivative, where x is between a and b. And I will just mention that this thing often, so often we estimate this part. So we don't always find the actual exact value for the maximum. Sometimes we're like, well, this value is good enough. Same is true for the Simpson's method. For Simpson's method, the error formula is that the error using Simpson's method in absolute value is less than or equal to b minus a to the fifth over 180 times n to the fourth. And then that's the maximum of the absolute value of the fourth derivative. Again, where x is between a and b. So let's look at some examples. Let's start with this not too terrible example. Let's say we wanted to, now some of these examples are gonna be things we could compute anyway because like they're just easier to show. That's not really the point of them, but that's what we're gonna do. So let's say we wanted to estimate or approximate, um, where'd you go? The integral from one to three of one over x dx. Um, sure. All right, one second. Using n equal to four intervals with the first to do the trapezoid method. So when I do this, I'm literally just throwing the formula at it, right? I'm not literally. So I'll buy it. So side rant. It's terrible that the word literally now is defined to also mean figuratively. I just wanted to point that out. It is literally terrible. It is also figuratively terrible, but I just have to say, it seems really dumb that the word literally now means it's the opposite thing as well. Okay, rant over. Anyway, so I'm not literally throwing the formula at it. I'm figuratively throwing the formula at it. I'm putting this into the formula. So I know that my delta X is B minus A over N, which is just gonna be one half. And then I have to find my, my points I'm gonna plug in. And I really think it's easiest to do this just by drawing a picture of the x-axis. So here's my x-axis. I only really care about from one to three, and then I'm just breaking that up into four sections. So I know that my first point here is going to be one plus a half, and my next point is going to be two, and my next one is going to be two plus a half. Right? I'm really just taking my first point and adding the delta x to each of them. And then my estimate is going to be it's going to be my delta x over 2 times f of 1 plus 2 times f of 1.5 plus 2 times f of 2 plus 2 times f of 2.5 plus 1 times f of 3. Right. I'm really not even thinking that hard about what I'm doing. I'm just like, I'm just mechanically plugging into the formula. And then, sorry, So we do that, I mean, we're going to get one fourth times f of one is one, f of 1.5, it might be better to use a fraction here, 
1.5 is three halves. And then my function being one over X, I'm gonna get the reciprocal of that. So it's gonna be two thirds. I'm gonna have two times two thirds plus two times one half plus two times, let's see, 2.5 is five halves. So the reciprocal is two fifths plus one third. Adding this together is not particularly nice, right? I don't actually want to calculate that by hand. So typically at this point, I break out the calculus like, okay, this is going to be approximately 1.1167. Okay. What about the error? So the thing is, for this problem, we can actually calculate the exact error because we can actually cal the, calculate the exact integral. So we're going to calculate the exact error first, and then we're going to see what the error approximation would be. So the error in actuality, well, the integral is actually equal to, if I take the antiderivative of that, it's going to be the natural log of the absolute value of x evaluated from 1 to 3, which is going to be the natural log of 3 minus the natural log of 1. Natural log of one is zero, and the natural log of three is approximately 1.0986. Again, calculator, right? And then our error is equal to the absolute value of the exact value minus the approximation, and that's going to be the absolute value of 1.0986 minus. 1.1167. We do that subtraction, we get about 0 0.0181. How does that compare with what our error estimate tells us? Well, let's see. Oh, sorry. So what about the error estimate? Well, I'm going to use my trapezoid error estimate. So I'm going to say that my error using the trapezoid method should be less than or equal to E minus A, so three minus one cubed over 12 times four squared, right? That's my N. And then we have the maximum of the absolute value of the second derivative. My function was one over X, which is X to the minus one. My first derivative is negative X to the negative two. My second derivative is positive two X to the negative third or two over X cubed. So sometimes you get lucky in that this function, it's fairly easy to tell where it's biggest, right? If I'm looking, if I wanna find the maximum of two over x cubed on the interval from one to three, right? Because that's where my integral is covering. What value of x is going to make that the largest? One. Right. So a lot of the times you can just be like, oh, if I plug in one, it's the biggest, great. So the biggest this is going to be is two over one, which is two. So my error here is less than or equal to two cubed over 12 times 16 times the maximum of the absolute value is just going to be two. And that ends up equaling, um, let's see, we end up getting, I think, 1 over 24, which as a, 1 over 24? That looks wrong there. Sorry, let me see, 2, 8, 6. Oh, no, I'm wrong. I forgot about this 2 there. Sorry. That's 2 over 24, which is 1 over 12, which is approximately 0 0.0833. which is definitely bigger than our actual error. So our error estimate or I should say really the upper bound on the error is 0 0.0833 and the actual error should be less than that. And it was. The actual error was Looking back at the previous page, 0 0.0181, which is definitely less than 0 0.0833.
So that's something to take away is that whatever your error estimate is, it's really an upper bound on the error. So the error should never be larger than that. The error in all actuality will probably be smaller. Than that. It could actually be as big as that, but it almost never is. So, yeah, let's look at another example. So let's start with this example. We want to find the area under f of x equal to x squared plus x plus 1 on the interval from 0 to 4. In fact, I'm going to let you all do this one. Good practice. I know it's been a while. It has been a while. So I want you actually to find the area. So actually just anti-differentiate it and plug in the limits of integration. I think we're getting 100 over 3. We integrate we execute over 3 plus x squared over 2 plus x. We plug in 4s. We get some nice fractions. Good times. So let's see what happens if we approximate the area using Simpson's rule. with let's go n equal to, let's say n equal to four. Uh, let's go n equal to two. Let's be real lazy about it. Go n equal to two. So let's see. So n equal to two. So Simpson's rule is gonna be like, all right, well, I, so this is gonna look kind of weird. I'm gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna go from zero to four. I'm gonna break it up into two subsections. So my delta x is definitely four minus zero over two, which is two. And then I don't even get the whole formula, right? Usually the formula is like one, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, one. But I'm basically going to get one, four, one, right? There's only three points to plug in. So my formula, which is usually delta x over three times, you know, f of x naught plus four times f of x one. And then I have my last point, which is one times f of x two. In this particular example, and that's going to be Simpson's rule using two subintervals. That's going to equal, so my delta x is 2 over 3, then f of 0 plus 4 times f of 2 plus f of 4. So let's see what this ends up being. Um, let's see. So I'm going to get 2 thirds times f of 0 is 
Well, my function is x squared plus x plus one, so f of zero is one. F of two is four plus two plus one, which is seven. And then f of four is 16 plus four plus one, which is 21. That's gonna be two thirds times one plus 28 plus 21 is 29 plus 21, which is 50. Two thirds times 50 is 100 thirds. How interesting. Simpson's method actually exactly calculated the interval. Here's why this is happening. Simpson's method, and I know, so right, trapezoid method, you're literally drawing like trapezoids under the curve, right? Simpson's method, you are drawing parabolas under the curve. Well, if your curve already is a parabola, the approximating parabola is just the same parabola. So Simpson's method will exactly calculate the integral that is the integral of a quadratic. And also, interestingly, Simpson's method will actually exactly calculate the area if it's a cubic function as well. And we'll see why in a moment here. Well, in fact, we'll see why right now. So if you think about the error formula for a second, so the error formula using Simpson's method is again, b minus a to the fifth over 12 n to the fourth times the maximum of the absolute value of the fourth derivative. So in this particular problem, if our, you know, our a is zero, our b is four, our n is two, and our function is x squared plus x plus one, check this out. Our error using Simpson's rule, sorry, it's less than or equal to, not equal to, apologies, is less than or equal to uh, four minus zero to the fifth over 12 times two to the fourth times, uh, let's take some derivatives. The first derivative is two X plus one. The second derivative is two. The third derivative is zero. The fourth derivative is also zero. So no matter what I plug in for X, the maximum that derivative can be is zero, which means the maximum the error can be is zero. And if the error is zero, that means that the thing we use to approximate it is actually exactly correct. Kind of cool. So Simpson's method actually literally, literally this time, um, correctly calculates an integral of a quadratic or even a cubic function. And you can see it would work for a cubic function as well, right? Because if my function was a cubic function of x, well, the third derivative would be constant and the fourth derivative would still be zero. So it would still work. It's kind of neat. So let's look at some more examples. Mm, sure. Yeah. So let's go back to the example we were doing before, the example of one over X. So now we're going to approximate the integral from one to three of one over X DX using Simpson's rule. And again, N equal to four. So this integral is going to be, I usually, I really do like to use the notation S4 to say I'm using Simpson's rule with four subintervals. Um, and I really do think drawing out the thing, I know I already drew it out before, but again, I'm just thinking of breaking this up into four equal subsections. So that point there is at three halves and then at two and then at five halves. So I'm going to get my delta x, which is one half over three times one times f of one plus four times f of three halves plus two times f of two plus four times f of five halves plus one times f of three. I'm like, did I start the zoom? I'm going to feel really dumb if I didn't actually start the zoom. Oh my God. No, did I not start? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. I like, there's no one has come into the Zoom. So I'm like, where is everybody? Okay. I'm pretty sure I started the Zoom. If I didn't, no, it looks, it looks like, yeah, I'm definitely screen sharing. Okay. Yeah. I'm not crazy. The Zoom is actually going. Just no one came on Zoom. That's okay. So this is going to equal one half over three is one sixth. F of one is one. F of two thirds is three, sorry, F of three halves is two thirds. 
f of two is one half and two times one half is one. f of five halves is two fifths and f of three is one third. And adding all this together, we get approximately 1.1000. And then from before we can say, well, the actual error is the actual value, which we said before was about 1.0986 minus the estimated value. And that is going to be about 0 0.0014. Notably, that's a better estimate than our trapezoid rule. If we look back for a second at our trapezoid rule estimate error, we had a value of five pages here. Our error there was 0 0.0181. This is a much smaller error, so it's a better estimate. And that's generally true. Simpson's method should almost always be a better estimator of your integral than the trapezoid method. So then let's talk about the error formula for Simpson's rule for this particular example. So let's check and make sure that that makes sense. Ah, come on, pages. So if I wanted to find an upper bound for the error for Simpson's rule, that's gonna be less than or equal to, you're gonna see this formula a number of times, d minus a to the fifth over 180 n to the fourth times the maximum of the fourth absolute value of the fourth derivative of x on the interval from one to three. So we need the fourth derivative. Again, this one's not too terrible. Our function was x to the negative first. Our first derivative is negative x to the negative second. Our second derivative is two x to the negative third. Our third derivative is negative six x to the negative fourth. And our fourth derivative finally is 24 x to the negative fifth or 24 over x to the fifth. And just like the previous one, we can see that this is the most when x is equal to one. So a lot of the times people are gonna try and give you functions where it's, you don't have to like work super hard to see where it's the biggest or its derivative is the biggest or smallest. So here, this is going to be less than or equal to three minus one to the fifth over 180 times four to the fourth times 24. And if I were simplifying this, I would do a few things. So this is gonna equal two to the fifth over 180 times four to the fourth times 24. And I might cancel a four here and a four here. And then two to the fifth is 32 times six, 180 times four cubed is 64. I can cancel that and that, I can cancel that and that, and I cancel that and that. So it looks like I'm left with one over 60. It should be there. Let me double check there. Yeah, which is approximately 0 0.0167. So that's our upper bound for error. And again, we see, yeah, great. Our actual error was certainly less than our upper bound for error, which it should be. So if you were able to calculate the actual error and the upper bound for error, and that's not smaller than that, you need to go back and check your work, right? Because something is going on, but there's an error somewhere. Ha, ah, error. You guys like, yeah, there. Okay. Oh, geez. Okay, clinging water everywhere. Um, questions so far about anything I've said? Okay. So the other thing we often like to ask is, and we did a question like this last time, how big should N be so that the Simpson's rule estimate of the integral from one to three of one over x dx is accurate to within um, 0 0.0001. Yeah, which our previous example certainly was not. So again, we're not actually going to find the actual n value because we don't know, right? I mean, we could keep trying bigger and bigger values of n, 
and then calculating the area and then calculating the exact error because we can calculate the exact error here. But the idea is we're going to use this error formula and say, okay, we want this error formula, which we know is less than or equal to three minus one to the fifth over 180 times n to the fourth times 24, right? We actually did this work already, so we don't need to do it again. We want this error to be less than how much? Well, 0 0.0001, or as a fraction, one over 10,000. And I would encourage you to write it as a fraction if you get it to be easier to deal with. So that's the idea. We want that to, we want this, which is less than this, to be less than this. So it boils down to setting your error to be less than the thing that you want to be bounded. And then you're going to isolate it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by n to the fourth, I'm going to multiply both sides by 10,000. So I'm going to get on the left 10,000 times two to the fifth, which is 32 over 180. Oh, I forgot the 24 times 24. I want that to be less than n to the fourth. We could simplify this if we really wanted to, but really at this point, you're just plugging into your calculator. So you could sit, you're going to say, okay, n needs to be bigger than the fourth root of this gross number here 10,000 times 32 times 24 over 180. Sometimes people will try to make this nice on a test. Like you might end up getting something here like the fourth root of, I don't know, would be, I'm not trying to think what would be a nice number. You might end up with something like, for example, the fourth root of like zero, 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 like 16,000. Is that a nice number? I'm like, is it, is that 20 to the fourth? Uh, 20 to the 20 is 400, 400 times 400 is, yeah, what, four zeros? Four zeros, I think 160,000. Someone might try to make like this happen on the test. So then you're taking the fourth root of it, you're like, oh, well, the fourth root of 160,000 is 20. I feel like I might be off by a zero, but I don't think I actually am. So like 20 times 20 is 400, 400 times 400 is 16 or four zeros. Yeah, we're good, okay. But right, that's probably not gonna happen. So if we plug this into a calculator, which we might not get to use on an exam, this is going to be approximately 14.37. Now, obviously N needs to be a whole number, right? We can't say I'm gonna, break it up into 14.37 equal subintervals. So what should I round up to? Aha, that's where I tricked you. Right, so that, and this is, so people will always try to make this happen. If they ask you a Simpsons rule error question and they're like, you have, how big does N have to be? They're almost gonna always try to make it so you get something a little bigger than an even number. So you have to go up to the next even number. So we have to pick N equal to 16. For Simpsons rule, for if this was trapezoid instead, I would go up to 15. Because it's Simpsons rule, we have to go up to 16. So just remember, Simpsons rule is always even. Um, yeah, let's do a couple more of those. So let's find, we want to find N so that the trapezoid rule estimate of what have I got here? The integral from two to eight of one over the natural log of x dx is accurate to within 10 to the negative third. Okay, so this is gonna be a little bit gnarlier. Um, knowing that I'm gonna use this formula, the thing I should really start with is my derivative stuff. Right, like I know it's going to be b minus a cubed over 12n squared times the maximum of the second derivative. So I need to first, or I think I should first worry about what is the maximum of the second derivative in absolute value on the interval from two to eight? Or what's a good approximation of it, right? I might not actually find the exact maximum, that's okay. So my function, is the natural log of x to the negative first, which I definitely want to write that way to make it easier to differentiate. My first derivative is negative one times the natural log of x to the negative two times the derivative of the natural log of x, which is one over x. Okay, it's looking a little funky there. It's all right. My second derivative 
I'm going to think of this as my first piece. This is my second piece. My second derivative is going to be the derivative of that first part. So it's going to be positive two times the natural log of x to the negative third times one over x. That's my f prime. And then times g, which is another one over x. Plus, then we're going to do it the other way. It's going to be a negative natural log of x to the negative second. That's my f times the derivative of one over x, which is negative one over x squared. That's looking pretty funky there. So putting that all together, mm, yeah. Well, let's actually, let's simplify that. So rewriting this, I have a two on top. I have an x squared times natural log of x cubed on the bottom. Over here, I have a minus, oh, sorry, a plus, right? Because it's a minus times a minus. It's like a one on top and x squared times the natural log of x squared on the bottom. And it's probably going to be easiest to deal with this if I get a common denominator. So I'm going to multiply this part over here. I never have enough room, never enough room. Multiply this by natural log of x over natural log of x to get that my second derivative here is equal to two plus the natural log of x over x squared times the natural log of x squared. All right, here's what I don't want to do. So normally, if you're trying to maximize a function, how do we take, how do we maximize a function 16a? I know it's been a while, but to maximize a function, you take its derivative and you set it equal to zero to find the critical values and then you test to see if it's actually an accident. I really don't want to take another derivative here, right? This is already gross enough. Taking, taking the derivative of this and then setting it equal to zero might be really, really challenging. More importantly, it's really, really unnecessary. So if I want to maximize this, I'm going to use what I typically think of, what we kind of all refer to as the high-low method, meaning you make the numerator as big as possible, you make the denominator as small as possible. So if I want to maximize this on the interval x between two and eight, we're going to make the top or make the numerator as large as possible, make the denominator as small as possible. Okay, so Fortunately here, we have functions that are all increasing. Natural log of X gets bigger from left to right. X squared gets bigger from left to right. So it's really easy-ish to see that if I plug in eight to the top, that'll make the numerator as big as possible. So we know that for sure, F prime of X is going to be less than or equal to two plus the natural log of eight over, and then I'll plug in two to make the denominator as small as possible. Two squared times the natural log of two squared. It's still not very nice, right? Like you still need to calculate to even get what this is. This is approximately 3.06. It would probably be one sec. It'd probably be safe to round down to three, but yeah. Question. Can we apply this number to set up getting three? Yes. Yeah. So that's exactly like even though this still looks kind of gross, it's better than actually taking the derivative of this and trying to find where you have an actual maximum. Yeah. Um, you might be right. It was, yes, thank you. Sorry, good call. Yes. Yeah, which is what I have right now. So then we go back and actually go to the formula, right? So then we're going to say, okay, so our error using the trapezoid method, I probably should try. I was going to try and put this in here. I feel like it's not really going to try. I should just use more paper. It's okay. So then we're going to use that to say we want our error using the trapezoid method. But we know that's less than or equal to um, B minus A cubed over 12 N squared times this thing we just found. 
which is equal to, well, our B minus A is eight minus two times 3.06. And we want that to be less than our 10 to the negative third. And then at that point, we're solving an inequality that we usually would. We're always just gonna multiply both sides by the N to whatever power and divide and multiply both sides by whatever we have over here. So I have six cubed over 12 N squared times 3.06, less than one over a thousand. That's gonna become six cubed times 3.06 times a thousand over 12, less than N squared. So N is gonna to have to be bigger than the square root of this monstrosity over here. And then if we use the calculator, we get approximately 235.7, which we round up to 236. This is not the only plausible answer, right? There are probably actually smaller values of n. So if we'd actually found the actual maximum, we probably would have gotten a smaller value for n. And that's okay. It's okay to, to overestimate how big that needs to be. Oh, we got lots of time. Okay. All right, let's do one more of these and then we will. Sorry. So find N so that the trapezoid rule estimate of the integral from zero to one of sine of x squared dx is accurate to within 10 to the negative fourth. And again, we're gonna start by doing the derivative stuff. So our first derivative of sine of x squared is cosine of x squared times two x. And our second derivative is going to be negative sine of x squared times 2x times 2x plus cosine of x squared times 2. And we could simplify this a little bit just to help us see what's happening. That's going to be 2 cosine of x squared minus 4x squared times sine of x squared. So now what? I want to make this as big as possible. Well, Here's what we're going to use. We're going to use the fact that cosine of anything is always between what? Negative one and one. And so is sine of anything. Sine of anything is always between negative one and one. So I know that looking at this, this could be as big potentially as two. Right, I could get that up to two possibly. If, if X was zero, cosine of zero is one, two times one is two. Also plausibly, this could get up to be as big as positive four, right? Because this is a four, this is, can be as big as one, and this can be, I could get this maybe to be negative one. So making this as negative as possible makes this whole thing as big as possible. So this whole piece could be, as big as positive four. So I can think of this as well, this is certainly gonna be less than or equal to two plus four, which is six. Now maybe I can make that smaller, right? Maybe that really isn't the true maximum, but it's certainly an upper bound for the maximum, right? There's no way that that could be bigger than six. So usually when we have sine and cosine, we're just like, oh, sine, the biggest it can be is one, small thing is negative one. Cosine, the biggest it can be is one, small thing is negative one. Um, I feel like I might be kind of glossing over the negative sign of this. So let me rewrite this just so it's a little bit easier to see. You could also write this as negative four X squared times sine of X squared plus two cosine of X squared. And then I think it's maybe a little easier to be like, oh yeah, the biggest this can be is two times one, 
the biggest this can be is negative four times one times negative one. But that's the biggest each of these can be. And then that's gonna give me six. So a lot of this is a little hand wavy. People are like, well, I can, but I can make this as big as possible. And then that's what we're gonna do. So then my trapezoid error is less than or equal to one minus zero to the third over 12 times n squared times this maximum we just found, which is six. And we want that to be less than 10 to the fourth, which is one over, sorry, less than 10 to the negative fourth, which is one over 10,000. And then we're gonna solve for n. So we're gonna get, this one's actually not too, the numbers are not too bad, right? Six over 12 is just one half, so I have one over two n squared less than one over 10,000. So then n squared is gonna be bigger than 10,000 over two. So n is bigger than the square root of 5,000, which is approximately 70.7. .70. So n has to be 71. Not 72, right? Because it's not Simpson's rule, chapter four. So I've got some other examples I've written up here. I'm just trying to see if they're like they're really worthwhile. Kind of if no, I think that's enough. Um so yeah, these error formulas, they're kind of awful, but they're not so awful. I feel like Okay, I feel like we should do one more actually, because we I feel like I focus kind of heavily on the finding the end value so that the error is less than a number, but not actually finding the error. So let's do one more example where we actually find the error. So let's see. Sure. Let's not that one. Yeah, sure. Let's do that one. Uh, we did that one last time. Sorry, let me find one that we didn't do last time. We have new examples. Okay, this is a classic example. So let's look at the following integral. The integral from one to two of e to the negative x squared dx. And we are going to first So what's an upper bound on the trapezoid rule error using n equal to four subintervals. These questions I feel like are not super interesting and which is why people, teachers probably are less. I, I, if I were writing a test or giving homework, I would be much more likely to ask the other type of question where I'm like, how big does n have to be so that my error is less than whatever. This question feels more like I'm giving you all the information. Your job is just to throw a formula at it. So we can do that though. We know that the error bound for the trapezoid rule is less than or equal to d minus a cubed over 12 n squared times the maximum of the second derivative in alphabet. The hard part for any of these problems is this part right here, right? This part, no big deal, right? We know that this here is gonna be um, two minus one cubed over 12 times four squared. And we're left to fill in, what is this gonna be? Okay, so that's our job. We have to find this. Find or really approximate this. Okay, so our function is e to the negative x squared. Our first derivative is e to the negative x squared times 2x, sorry, times negative 2x, apologies. And our second derivative is product rule, e to the negative x squared times negative 2x times negative 2x plus e to the negative x squared times negative 2. 
And it probably is worthwhile to actually simplify this in that I can factor out an e to the negative x squared and I'm left with a 4x squared minus 2. So I have a 4x squared minus 2 over e to the x squared. We could find, we could really, I mean, I kind of want to find the third derivative. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and do it just to see, because like your teacher might ask, actually ask you to do it this way. So if I want to find the maximum of f double prime, we're going to find the next derivative. So the third derivative, and let's go ahead and use the quotient rule. So it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is e to the x squared times 2x all over the bottom squared. Okay, it's not as bad as it looks. I mean, it's pretty bad, but it's not as bad as it looks. So I can factor out an e to the x squared from the top. I feel like I, feel like I need to make sure I'm not making, a, no, that seems totally fine. It just, I always feel like, it always feels like you could be making a mistake, but no, I think we're good. I can factor out e to the x squared, yeah. So I'm gonna get e to the x squared times 8x minus, I have a 4x squared minus two times a 2x. So I'm gonna have a minus 4x squared times 2x, so a minus 8x cubed, and a minus minus two times 2x, so a plus 4x, all over e to the x squared squared. Cancel one of those, cancel one of those. Simplify the top, you've got 12x minus 8x cubed over e to the x squared. Okay. So if we factor out an x, that's not equal to zero, we can actually find some critical values. How interesting. So let's see here. We definitely have x equal to zero. That's one critical value. And then 12 minus 8x squared equal to zero is going to give me 12 equal to 8x squared x squared equals 12 over 8. x equals the plus or minus square root of 12 over 8 reduces to what? 3 over 2? Okay, right? So I think just doing this, you can kind of see why we don't do this, right? Like this seems like a pain in the butt and it's unnecessary, but it's good to see it one more. So then we have to remember that our interval is 1 to 2. So most of these critical points don't actually matter. The critical point that actually matters is x equal to the positive square root of three halves. So that, now here's, here's what could be a real bummer. Maybe that's a minimum. We have to check and see it's a maximum. So if I look at my, my derivative of my second derivative, I look at the number line, right at positive root three over two, if I look at my function there, if I pick a number slightly larger than that, this part's going to be negative, this part's going to be positive, this part's going to be positive. So it's going to be positive over here. Sorry, not positive. I know I said positive, it's not positive. I just said it's a negative, sorry, it's a positive times a negative times a positive. That should be negative. And I pick a number slightly smaller than this, that's still positive. That's still positive. And 12 minus that's going to be slightly positive because it's a 12 minus the number. It's a little bit smaller than 12. So we are increasing, decreasing. So great, we do have a maximum. Great. So we do have a maximum at x equal to the positive of square root of 3 over 2. So then we go back to our second derivative, f double prime of x, which is equal to 4x squared minus 2 over e to the x squared. And we plug in. So f of the square root of three halves. Luckily, this isn't too terrible to plug in. It's four times, well, the square root of three halves squared is three halves minus two over e to the square root of three halves squared is e to the three halves. Four times three halves is six. Six minus two is four. So we get four over e to the three halves. Great. So one way of doing this, we would get 
that. And if we calculate this, I didn't actually calculate this ahead of time. So let's grab my calculator. Okay. So calculating this, let's see what we get. I'm going to be smart. I'm going to say, well, I've got one over 12 times four squared times four over e to the three halves. A four cancels, a four cancels. So I have one over 48 times e to the three halves, which is approximately, let's see, 48 times e to the 1.5. So we get approximately 0 0.0046. It's a pretty good estimate of something using only four subintervals. Now, just to kind of show you the contrast, here's what I probably would have actually done if I were doing this. So instead of doing this terrible finding the critical value, I would have taken this second derivative right here and said, okay, I want to make that as big as possible. So if my second derivative is 4x squared minus 2 over e to the x squared. And I want to make this as big as humanly possible on the interval from 1 to 2. I'm just going to use the high-low method. So I make the top as big as possible by plugging in 2 for x. So 4 times 2 squared minus 2. The bottom as small as possible by plugging in 1 for x. So e to the 1 squared. That's going to be four times four minus two, so 14 over e. So how do those compare? 14 over e, just so you know. In fact, let's just plug it into the formula. So then our error using the trapezoid method using that value would have been one over 12 times four squared times 14 over e, which is approximately 0. 0.0268. Okay. I mean, not as good of an estimate, or I should say not as not as good of an error, right? A lesser error is better, but still perfectly fine. So the point of doing it this long terrible way is that you don't have to do this long terrible way. Or you could totally do this. This is the better, this is the more accurate estimator but we're just trying to find an upper bound for the error. If this is an upper bound, this is also an upper bound. I wanna, I wanna actually emphasize that again. If this is the actual, like this is the, I should say, this here is the least upper bound, right? Using the formula, doing it, everything super precisely, this is the smallest upper bound for the error we could get. But it's certainly okay to have a larger upper bound. All we're saying is the error has to be less than either one of these numbers. Well, it has to be less than this, it certainly has to be less than this. Okay, and I think, yeah, I think that's enough, All right? We could do more, no. Let's, so there's also some volume questions on your homework. I'm pretty, I mean, let me take a look. I'm pretty sure there are. Homework number eight due tomorrow. Say that one more time. Sure, that makes sense. Oh yeah, because you only have to do like half the problems or whatever. Um, it's still worth talking about volume. So let's see. There's a lot of yeah, setup, setup, setup. Cool. So let's do a few volume problems just so, because I mean, it's. Let's see. Does it come back in 16C. I mean, more than this is like. Yeah, it could it could show up in 16C. Let's talk. About it. Oh yeah. No, definitely, yeah, volume is something we could definitely talk about. So I know we talked about volume like weeks ago. Is it a class with new volume? But let's do a few volume examples. So yeah, sure. So let's say we want to set up integral for the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by sure, y equal to x squared and y equal to 3x around the 
x-axis. So almost any time I'm doing a problem like this, I think I want to draw a picture. You don't have to have to draw a picture, but usually it's a good idea to draw a picture. So I've got y equals x squared, y equals 3x. I should probably figure out where they intersect each other before I draw the picture, just so I know what I'm doing. So if I set those equal to each other, um, you shouldn't divide both sides by x because you'll lose a zero. We should bring everything to the left side and factor. So we get x equal to zero and x equal to three. So those are my points of intersection. So we're going to intersect at the point zero, zero and the point three comma nine. Great. So I'm looking something like this. Right, there's the there's my parabola. Doing, whoops, that can't make my line. Sure. But I only really care about the, the region where they're intersecting. And then we're rotating around the x-axis. So whenever we are trying to find a volume like this, we're always thinking of using the disk slash washer method. And I do say slash because they're really the same method. The only difference between the disk and washer method is the disk method, you don't have an inner circle that you're subtracting out. Whereas with the washer method, you do. I mean, a disk, literally, when I say disk, I mean like a shape like a disk. Like, do I have a disk? I don't have a disk. Whereas a washer, I mean a shape like a washer where you don't have the little inner circle. And all of it really boils down to is is your region flush with its axis of rotation or not? This region here, definitely not flush with the axis of rotation, right? It's not fully against the axis of rotation the whole time over the whole region. So here we're definitely going to be using the washer method because the region is not flush with the axis of rotation. To see this more clearly, I'm always going to draw a strip. And the strip you're going to draw in your region, 100% of the time, must be perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So since I'm going around the x-axis, I need a vertical strip that is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And so when I draw this, what I'm actually going to think about is rotating that little strip around the axis. So if I do that, it's kind of easier if I move it over here. If I rotate that around, doesn't look the best that I've ever drawn. There's my washer. And the volume of this washer is equal to the area times the thickness. But the area is the area of the big circle minus the area of the little circle. Great, so the area is pi times the large radius squared minus pi times the small radius squared. Those are the areas of your circles. And the thickness is a small change in what? A small change in x or a small change in y? X, right? Because, right, so this here, right, that thickness of that slice, that strip, that thickness is a little change in x, right? It moves slightly from the left to the right. And I'm going to call that dx, a small change in x. You could also call it delta x if you prefer, but really we're thinking of them in the same way. Delta x, dx, same idea. So then to find the total volume, we are going to add up all the slices or washers. And when I say add up in print in, in quotes like that, what I mean is we're going to do the integral. We're going to add up all the slices from over here to over here. So from zero to three. And that's going to be pi times, oh, what's the big radius? Well, the big radius is the function that's further away from the axis of rotation. In this case, it's going to be three X minus pi times the little radius 
is the closer function. In this case, it's x squared. And that's how we set up this interval. And this is kind of always the idea with the washer method. Whenever you're rotating a, a region around an axis, it's always pi times the outer radius squared, and the outer radius is just the function that's further from the axis of rotation, minus pi times the smaller radius squared, which is the function that's closer to the axis of rotation. I would encourage you not to think of the words higher and lower. I really want to think of the words further from the axis of rotation or closer to the axis of rotation. And here's why. What if instead we wanted to set up, now we want to set up an integral for the volume of the same region, but now revolved around the line y equal to 11. So I'm going to draw the same picture. There's my same region where they intersect at 0, 0, and 3, comma 9. But now, I want to rotate around that axis there. I'm still going to draw a vertical strip, right? Because my axis is still horizontal. So my strip still needs to be perpendicular to that, which is vertical. But now I'm not rotating around the x-axis. I'm rotating around this line here. So I have to think about, OK, my strip is going to rotate around this line here. So here's my washer now. And it looks pretty distinctly different from that washer there. I mean, right, drawing notwithstanding, like they really are different, right? This strip, which is located approximately in the same place in the region, definitely has a lot further to travel around this y equals 11 axis than this y equals zero axis over here. We're still gonna think of it in the same way. Our volume of our washer is still just gonna be the area of the big circle minus the area of the little circle times the thickness. But in this case, that's my larger radius. The pen is dying. So my larger radius is the distance from the further function to the axis of rotation. If I want to find the distance between two things, how do I usually find the distance between two things? Subtraction, right? I mean, so that's just going to be 11 minus my further away function, which is x squared. And my smaller radius, oh, that's not the smaller radius. There's my smaller radius. My smaller radius is going to be my difference between my axis of rotation and my closer function. So it's going to be 11 minus. 3x. So if we set this one up, the total volume is going to be the integral still from 0 to 3, but now it's going to be 11 minus x squared squared times pi minus pi times 11 minus 3x squared. Which is a terrible thing to calculate, right? You have to multiply it out, subtract stuff, do the integral, but it's not too hard to set up. So let's look at this. Let's look at one more version of this particular one. What if I wanted to instead go around the line y equal to negative 2? I'm not even going to draw. I'm just going to draw a little picture this time. So 
So if we're setting this one up, or again, this line is y equals 3x. This is y equals x squared. I'm going to ask both of you, what is my larger radius in this one? And what is my smaller radius? This one. Right, 3x is definitely the function that's further away. So my larger radius is going to be what? Almost, except, the, well, so here's, the, here's actually the truth. That would actually work here because we're going to end up squaring it anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's actually positive or negative. But technically, the way I should write the larger radius is 3x minus negative 2 because it should be the larger thing minus the smaller thing. And 3x is definitely larger than y plus negative 2. And my smaller radius is going to be the closer thing. So it's going to be x squared minus negative 2. So those are what would go in here. This would be 3x plus 2. This would be x squared plus 2. Question? Ah, that's a good question. Hmm. Let's see. So let's say I ask the same question, but I said you were disbarred from graphing it. So if I wanted to find the volume of that region between y equals x squared and y equals 3x revolve around y equals negative 2. OK, so let's see. Let's, uh, we're not going to draw a graph. OK, so points of intersection. We found them before. We know the intersection points are y, sorry, x, y equal to 0, 0, and x, y equal to 3, 9. So here's what we do know. We know that we're going to do the integral from the left limit of x equal to 0 to the right limit of x equal to 3. And it is going to be pi times the big radius squared minus pi times the little radius squared. And typically people do factor out the pi here. I haven't been doing that, but totally we would factor out the pi and be like. So how do we find the big R without actually drawing it? So let's see. So we know we're between zero and three. So between zero and three. So I will just say before I do this, it's definitely easier to draw. Like if it's, if it's a function that's not too hard to draw, drawing it's usually the easier way to go. But if we couldn't draw it, I'm going to say, well, between 0 and 3, which function is bigger? y equal to x squared or y equal to 3x? Well, the way we answer that is by picking a point between 0 and 3. Pick anything you like, 1 or 2. I mean, you can pick like something dumb, like 1.5. But pick something easy. Pick 1. So we pick x equal to 1 y equals x squared is going to be y equals 1 squared is 1. And y equals 3x is going to be y equals 3 times 1, which is 3. So that's the bigger function, y equal to 3x. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so then now the other question you have to answer, though, is which one is further away from the axis of rotation? So how do we tell, yeah, how do we tell without drawing it? So I know that this one's bigger. I know my axis of rotation is y equal to negative 2. So of these two values, which of those is further away from negative 2, 3 or 1? 3. So this is also the one that's further away. But just to point out, if we were in the previous example where it was y equal to 11, right, then it would be this one that was further away because one is further from 11 than three is. So basically, you look at your axis of rotation and be like, well, if I do the subtraction in the, in the right direction, meaning you want, you want to subtract so you get something positive, three minus negative two is bigger than one minus negative two, which actually kind of helps us because it also indicates which way we should subtract. So setting this up, I should be like, oh, my integral is going to be pi times the integral of from 0 to 3 of the bigger function, 
or the further away function. And I should do this one minus this one because that's going to get me a positive radius. So it's going to be 3x minus negative 2 squared minus my smaller radius is going to be this function, which was y equal to x squared. So yeah, you can do it without graphing it. I just feel like it's, it takes more mental effort. But again, right, sometimes the graphs are not easy to graph. Um, and then if we looked at the same region but revolved around, say, the y-axis, and I am going to draw it because I like drawing it. So now if we're revolving around the y-axis, we do have to use a horizontal strip. So now my volume is still going to be the same thing. It's still going to be the integral of pi times my large radius squared minus pi times my small radius squared. But in this case, since I'm using a horizontal strip, it's going to be a dy. So my outer radius here is the function that's further away from the axis of rotation. My inner radius is the function that's closer to the axis of rotation. So here my outer radius, well, that was the function y equals x squared, but now I have to solve for x as a function of y. So my outer radius is going to be x equal to the positive square root of y. My inner, my inner function was y equal to 3x. So my inner radius is going to be, I shouldn't really use an equal sign there, I have to use a colon. My inner radius is going to be, instead of y equal to 3x, x equal to y divided by 3. So this volume would be the integral Let's factor out the pi of my outer radius squared minus my inner radius squared dy. Limits of integration before they were x equals zero to x equals three. Now they're going to be y equals zero to y equals nine. Because we're going bottom to top instead of left to right. And I should stop talking because this is 12, 10 is 1020, not 1220, 1020.